Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here um, at Slush, and it's, I think, the first time I was asked to change my shoes before I actually walked on, on stage. Um, you know, here we have more than 2,000 startups uh, present. We have more than 1,000 investors. Uh, Slush has really become an amazing uh, event and um, a great place to meet uh, people that are like-minded, that want the same goals, that have the same goals as you. Um, and Finland is, of course, well known uh, for its innovation power. Uh, I'm impressed to uh, see what the Finnish startup community has succeeded uh, to create the most important European startup event. And if you go back 18 months, um, there was virtually no collaboration between the Nordic startup hubs. And even if from the outside, the Nordics, they look quite homogeneous. But now that's changing. And not to mention the successes of uh, our region, the Nordics have generated more than 10% of all billion dollar exits worldwide. And gatherings like Slush uh, can take part of the credit for, for that success. In Norway, there are many startups, startup events. At Slush 2016, there are twice as many Norwegian participants as last year. And there's a lot happening in Norway now, a lot of energy. Um, and um, we're bringing some of that energy here today. We have not yet maybe produced a unicorn in the current, se current sense of the term, like Skype or Spotify and Klarna in Sweden. Uh, or Supercell and uh, Rovio in Finland, and Just Eat and uh, Trustpilot in Denmark. But while you guys were um, programming, we were busy using the North Sea uh, as our la largest incubator. But times are changing, and there are several companies in the running, and I believe we shall soon read about the first Norwegian unicorn as well. Great names like uh, Fast, Opera, and Tanberg. Pro prove that it's possible. And Kahoot is uh, changing the way uh, our kids learn at school, and we will hear from Unicast shortly. But we should, I guess, also remember that uh, rabbits are great animals too. And slush can help, so I urge you to use your time here wisely. During my recent visit to Stavanger to um, uh, warm up for, for slush, uh, I was told that bringing home 15 contacts uh, at Slush would be a failure. You should bring back hundreds. On the other hand, a single contact may be enough if that is the right one. So if you are to make these important contacts, you don't really have time to listen to me anymore. Uh, good luck with your networking and uh, thank you for your, thank you for your uh, time and uh, I look forward to spending some uh, more time listening to uh, all the pitches. Thank you, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Cybergs, if someone is here there. Uh, welcome to the Nordic Showcase. I'm here to uh, present, my, oh, I have to present myself. Yeah, sorry. My name is Maria Mali. I'm a writer and a journalist from Norway. Uh, I'm working on a book about Norwegian uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm planning a book about Nordic entrepreneurs as well. Really excited to be here. Um, so our first uh, startup on stage, she is pretty awesome. Her name is Elina Berglund. And she's CTO and co-founder of a startup called Natural Cycles. Please welcome her on stage. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. So nice to be here and what an awesome stage. There's even fire. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Natural Cycles, which is an app that analyzes the body temperature of a woman to determine when she's fertile and even more importantly, when she's not fertile. This app is used to two-thirds of our users to prevent pregnancy and to one-third of our users to plan a pregnancy. It's pretty simple. Uh, when our users wake up in the morning, she measures her temperature in the mouth and enters it into the app. Then the algorithm runs in the background, crunches the numbers and returns either a red day if she's fertile or a green day if there's no risk of pregnancy that day. Natural Cycles was founded by two physicists, my husband and myself, basically because we needed for a natural birth control that was reliable and there was no such thing on the market, so we created one for ourselves. Me, I'm a, originally a particle physicist. I was part of the team that discovered the Higgs particle at CERN that led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013. And I used my skills in advanced statistics and mathematics and applied it to known medical research to develop the algorithm behind natural cycles. And I'm really not exaggerating when I'm telling you this, that our algorithm is by far the best thing that's out there today. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the need and the pain that we are addressing it's pretty clear, but still it's been neglected by the world for several decades. One billion women worldwide want to prevent pregnancies, but there is no effective, safe and easy to scale birth control solution. Women in the Western world are frustrated with the side effects and health risks from hormonal birth control, and in the developing world there is limited access to contraceptive or it's not socially accepted. Something has to be done here, that's pretty clear. There is a need for more research in the field of women's reproductive health. And since research is in our company DNA, we have already performed three clinical studies together with uh, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. The last published study measured a so-called PEARL index from the women that use our app to prevent pregnancies. The results show that five women out of thousand per year get pregnant because we give the wrong green day. Seven out of 100 get pregnant for any reason, such as risking it on red days. And these results are very similar to that of the pearl index of the contraceptive pill. We're also the only fertility app that is an approved CE-marked medical device. It is ISO certified, which means that we follow international standards that apply to medical device manufacturers globally. And this is even though we are an app. I think that's pretty cool. Most importantly, our users, we call them our cyclers, they love our product. Today we have 135,000 cyclers, and even though anyone can download the app and try it out for free, we make revenue on a subscription model that has led to $4 million in revenue in the last two years. So, finally, I want to conclude with a few app store reviews from our users. Uh, every day they tell us that we have changed their lives to the better. And honestly, I think that's what makes my job probably the best job in the world. Thank you. Thank you. How does it feel? Oh, you're, great! Yeah, it was I love a really being good here. pitch. Um, I I think you are a rock star. I mean, I'm so inspired by you that you just done both a science thing, and not just anything, just doing really great discovery, but also doing an entrepreneur thing. So one of my questions is, um, how is it? Uh, like, what is what do you use as a, what as a scientist? and as an entrepreneur, like what you have learned as a scientist that's very practical for you to use as an entrepreneur? Well, I think in the end, the job is not that different because what I do is I look at data, I analyze it, I make conclusions, and then, um, yeah, it, it leads to either finding the Higgs boson or 
an app, which is Natural Cycles, but it's very similar the day-to-day -day job. And also, I think what's very important in researchers is, is tenacity, which is very important also as an entrepreneur. You need to basically never give up. Even yeah. though it looks dark, you need to continue working on what's really your passion, mm. your job, which yeah. is also your hobby, both if you're a researcher and an entrepreneur. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions about uh, gender equality and uh, women in tech sector. And I wonder, how is it when you go to investors? And we know that many, many investors are usually white male in the 50s, no offense. But how is it, and they have never been pregnant. <laughs> and how do you pitch your startup? Like, what, what are the key things you tell them to, to, to get uh, funding? Well, indeed, we mainly pitch to male investors. Um, but I think what's, why we break through to them is why most startups break through for them. You, you show them, you sell them a potential, something in the future, and you show them some numbers that are really exciting. And uh, that usually does the job. And usually men in their 50s also have a girlfriend and a wife, yeah. so they can, they can usually relate to some of the things. Yeah, cool. And what are your plans for Slush later? Are you going to stay here? Are you, can uh, you relax? I have or a, is it a crazy schedule, actually. <laughs> okay. Every minute is already booked. Okay. Uh, but that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think it's a really cool conference. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, good luck with your pitch. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Give her a warm applause. Thank you. <laughs> Not checking uh, Twitter, just <laughs> checking my notes. Uh, so the next uh, startup on stage is uh, Unacast, uh, and uh, the person presenting is uh, Thomas Valle. I'm particularly excited because they are from Norway. Well, give them a warm applause. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Thomas Wolle, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Unicast. And the whole world, online world, is now being indexed by Google. We know that. What we click, what we buy, what we read today is carefully organized and presented by some of the greatest companies in the world so we can have the best online experience. But there's a greater world out there, the world that we live in. And that world is now being quickly censored up with beacons and other proximity sensors, creating magical moments when our phone interacts with these sensors. And these sensors are being placed in hotels, in airports, in shopping malls, even in retail stores, placed in departments, even down to the products that we touch and feel. And every time our smartphone interacts with these sensors, we leave a digital footprint. And this footprint is unique data. If you look at a history of data, we are entering a new paradigm. It all started with online data. It was about understanding clicks. Then we went mobile. We could understand location, but limited to where people spend their time in a city or at a specific street. Now, with proximity data, we can start to understand what stores do people visit, what departments do they spend their time in, and what products do they actually look at and touch and feel. And this whole thing is enabled by the very rapidly growing proximity and beacon market. There's more than 8 million beacons deployed globally today already, and that will grow to more than 500 million the next five years. And if you look at some of the use cases where these magical moments are happening, Gimbal have deployed beacons at sports stadiums in the US. So based on where you sit in that sports stadium, you can receive seat upgrades and food directly to your seat. In London, Proxama have deployed beacons as buses and subways. So the second you enter the bus, boom, your ticket has been purchased. And even here at Slush, there's more than 200 beacons being deployed with nimble devices, helping us with wayfinding. If you haven't downloaded the app, the Slush app, you should definitely do it. It's a great way to show accuracy and how great this technology can be. But these three companies only represent three out of 400 companies globally creating these magical moments. So what if we can understand a customer's movement across these millions of sensors, hundreds of the different proximity companies? How would that affect our lives? Let's talk about retail. When I walk into a store, they don't know who I am. But that can be enabled with the use of proximity data. When I walk into the store, they can know who I am, where I've been, and my preferences, and what products I'm looking for. 
Only then, I believe, retail can really take up the competition with Amazon. Ads and marketing will be way more relevant, way more personalized, creating an even better online experience since we also can take this offline proximity behavior into account. And don't forget games. Games are going into location. Pokemon Go is just one of the few games now really bridging physical and digital. And I can promise you that a Pokemon behind the shoe shelf at Macy's, that will happen very, very soon. So what if this one company could understand all these movements across all these millions of beacons, hundreds of different proximity companies, to create that one unified view of where we spend our time at the most granular level? Well, that company is Unicast. And we have tied all these data points, all these sensors together, since the first sensors hit the market. Our team has done an amazing job and built the world's largest network of beacon and proximity companies, cemented our number one position, and many of the world's largest marketing and advertisement companies in the world are already licensing our data, fueling their marketing engine to create even better products and services for you. So we are entering into a new data era, a data era where we can finally understand what people do in the real world at the most granular level. And that era is spearheaded by Unicast. As we say it, we build the real world graph. Thank you. This stage hey, is really huge. Hey. Yeah, I have to like walk and it's a long walk. I should wear my Fitbit. Yeah, you, know? you should. Yeah, I forgot it. So, congrats. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, have, uh, I have an interesting question. Um, you and your co-founder, Chartan, you've been a lot in the media uh, in Norway and uh, talking a lot about gender equality. So I wonder why? why? Why do you care about that? Yeah, well, to us it's pretty simple. There's uh, roughly 50-50 with men and women on this planet, and <laughs> the products and the data that we provide is equally interesting for women as for, uh, for, uh, for men. I think if you build a company only skewing towards one gender, you will also affect how you build your products mm. and the services that you uh, provide. Mm. I think we actually have a good example of that. Uh, we were also part of the founding team at the music streaming service named Tidal, before mm. that was acquired by JC. And in the beginning, it was only male developers. Mm. So what happened was that the back button in the Tidal app was in the upper left corner. And if you are a female, you tend to have tinier hands than male. It's very challenging to hit that back button. So wow. the second we got a female engineer into the company, she, she said, we have to move that to the other side. Mm. So that's, it's just those small things that you miss if you don't balance men and uh, females. So you are looking for, you're hiring all the female oh. engineers. <laughs> we, are, we have lots of position <laughs> opens. If you want to work with us, please let me know. Yeah, I would love cool. to. Um, what I find interesting when I interview entrepreneurs is that no man is, a, is an island. There's always like power couples. There are always one, or two or three entrepreneurs, and they work really hard together. And they're almost like old married couples. Um, yeah. So I, you are based in New York now, and yes. uh, uh, your co-founder Ch uh, Chartan, he's in in Norway. Yes. In Oslo. So how do you like make this long distance uh, scaling global? thing work? <laughs> well, first, he's my work spouse. That's defined. And we have a long-distance relationship. That's true. <laughs> but I think if you want to have a long-distance relationship work, you have to be together for a lot of years. You have to know each other very, very well. And I'm very fortunate to have known KJ since uh, the last 10 years, actually. We yeah, because you worked together? Or we went to yeah. school together in oh, Copenhagen. Wow. We worked at Title together. Yeah. So we more or less spent more time together than any, anyone else. Mm. So I think if you want to make that work really well and send some of your teams or your co-founder to another country, you have to just make sure that you know each other so, so well. And we actually don't speak that often together mm. because we are so synced. Yeah. So it can actually go a week or two uh, without us talking together. Okay. But you kind of are on the same page. Or, yeah, yeah. Su surprisingly, yeah. Uh, or scary, <laughs> scary yeah, much really on the scary. same page. <laughs> uh, but did you, did you create a sheet of like um, uh, values and missions? That's why you don't have to speak it with each other each we day? We spent a lot of time on aligning okay. on the company, yeah. yeah. So we, 
spend a lot of time on making sure that we know exactly how we want to build Unicast and that we can also communicate that to the employees and to our stakeholders, to our, our partners. So most of our conversations are not very much business related. Mm -hmm. It's more about, okay, how can we make Unicast really work? How can we scale as quickly as we have done the last year, mm -hmm. the next coming years as well? Mm -hmm. So are you going to fly back to New York, or you still have time to party tonight? I uh, will party tonight, for yeah. sure. Yes. Very Great. much. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Our next startup on stage uh, is called UMD. Uh, and uh, uh, the founder and uh, yeah, serial entrepreneur, Matteo Berlucchi, is going to present it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matteo Berlucchi, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of URMD. And I'm really excited to be here today because I can share with you our dream of giving free healthcare for everyone, forever. What do these people have in common? Across space and time, these people need one thing. They need health advice. And this advice needs to be personal, trustworthy and actionable. And we need this advice because our bodies are the ultimate black boxes. Even if we carry them with us all day long, we know pretty much nothing about them, or very little. So there's only one person that knows about health and is the doctor. So we have to go to the doctor because they are the repository of this information. But the problem is that there's not enough of them. There's a huge demand and supply problem. Even in developed countries like the US, and even more so in developing countries, the lack of doctors is just getting worse. An estimated 2.5 billion people have no direct access to healthcare. So the key idea behind your MD was the realization that health knowledge is the single most important factor in improving healthcare. Healthcare is an information problem. 90% of visits to a doctor in the UK are for minor conditions. And up to 80% of these conditions could be sorted out on your own at home if you had the right information. Unfortunately, the alternative is only Dr. Google today, but Dr. Google didn't go to med school. And the problem is that their algorithm is not designed to understand you as an individual. So if we all type in the same symptoms in Google, we'll all get the same conditions. And there's no real guidance and trust in the content that you can find. So what you need, and this is what we built, is an artificially intelligent personal health assistant that can understand you individually, your individual problems, and give you the best possible health information. So we built a platform that understands what you say, your problem, it can guide you with very trustworthy health information, and if needed, it can connect you to third parties that can help you sort out your problem, like buying medicine or seeing a doctor. So the first thing we had to build was a smart natural language processing component that could understand whatever you say and transform it into medical language. We then realized that nobody had built what I call a map of conditions. Nobody had mapped all the relationship and the factors that make a doctor able to understand what is your potential condition. This is a huge job, it's very, gonna take many, many years. We started and we had to crowdsource the information from doctors because there's so many data points that you cannot do it very easily with a small team of doctors. And then we built an AI brain that can understand you as an individual and make sure it asks the right questions and narrows down to the potential condition that you may have. At that point, we need to give advice, and the best advice we found in the market today is from the NHS in the UK. They wrote this fantastic set of information that can be given to people to decide what to do with their own condition. This is an example of how your MD would understand that you're potentially gluten intolerant, starting from swollen hands and bloating of stomach, which if you try yourself on Google today, is not gonna be even mentioned as a possible condition. So our business model, is not dissimilar to Google and is to essentially become a marketing platform for health services so that we can direct people with a particular condition to the right providers to help them sorting out their problem. 
So we're creating a, a trusted health marketplace. This is an example of how we're integrating the partners in the service so that, again, people can find trusted service providers that don't sell them fake medicines and they don't potentially steal their credit card. The service doesn't need a user interface. It's chat-based, so it's actually available already on Facebook Messenger, where one of the 30 approved bots on Skype were on free basics in India um, and Africa with uh, Facebook, so users don't even have to pay for the data. Um, the biggest dream for us is to have this amazing social impact, both in developed and developing worlds. In the developed world, we can help millions of people self-care, reducing the pressure on the national health services. And in the developing world, we can help, lo help he local health workers be much more effective by using this assisting technology to enable them to be more accurate in the healthcare they deliver. We have already more than a million users. We need everybody to help us because we use machine learning from all the data we collect to improve. It's a very big task. I think we have one of the best systems in the world, and we're very excited about what we're doing. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. It was a great pitch. How, um, I, I looked through all the stuff you've done, I could have probably written a whole book. <laughs> You've done so many interesting things. And uh, uh, one of the questions I have is, like you both done, uh, you launched the first property. Website, uh, website. in Europe, yes. Yeah, what time, uh, yeah. It was in 1995. Yeah, and then you've done also some online services and mobile for yep. services. Um, and this industry is changing so fast. <laughs> how do you stay innovative? Like how, where do you find, where do you see what's the next trend? How do you see that? I think that the innovation is, is never ending. You yeah. just have to be a good observer. You have to look at the markets that are entrenched and they're kind of where, where people take for granted that that's how you do things, that's the place to innovate. Hmm. Because when people become lazy and they stop thinking about how to change things and optimize, that's generally where you yeah. can change it. And healthcare is a great sector because we still, you, you saw my, my slide, you still have the waiting room uh, for the doctor is the same as it was 200 years ago. Hmm. Nothing's really changed. Yeah. And is it, is it how, that's how you define opportunities? Like what, what, what are, the, for example, three key elements when you have, say you have 10 opportunities, yeah. like how do you choose which one you're going to make a business? So I think that the best criteria is to find opportunities that have a global, uh, they yeah. solve a global problem yeah. because then, you know, obviously you immediately have a much larger market. You want to look at opportunities in sectors where there is less competition or less innovation. Yeah, that's smart. And again, yeah. healthcare is lagging behind compared to e-commerce, personal finance and all the other mm. sectors. And, um, and then you need to have a very clear idea on how you monetize it. Because unfortunately, if you don't have a solid business model, you will struggle to raise finance, and, and that's dangerous. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how do you, um, when you start a new business, what mistakes are you trying to avoid? None of them, you have <laughs> no, to no, make no. them all. It's, uh, it's like okay. when your parents give you advice, uh, when you're a teenager, yeah. you just have to do it, and then you say, ah, my parents were right. <laughs> The best thing you can do is hire, uh, work with a mentor. Bring somebody okay. as a mentor, as an advisor, that can somehow, you know, it's like when you go and speak to friends, you trust them more than your parents. Okay. So, same yeah. mechanics. Yeah, and uh, what is a good mentor? Like, did you have a any? Good a mentor, good mentor? Yeah, I had good mentors in the past. There are people that are generous and they want to share their experience with you. Hmm. Yeah. And they like the idea of, of passing on some of what they've learned. And I think it's an important figure that unfortunately has disappeared a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be great to see more leaders, captains of industry, dedicating some time mm -hmm. mentoring, uh, you know, startup entrepreneurs. Mm. Are you doing mentoring yourself? I do mentoring yeah. as well, okay. when, uh, cool. as much as I can. Yeah, cool. Um, I don't have any more questions, actually. Okay, yeah. great. Thank I'll, you I'll probably very much. I have many much more backstage and later. But uh, thank you so much for thank your you time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> So we have the uh, next uh, startup. They have a funny name, Smarp. Um, they um, are, uh, th the name is Rupa Heinela. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, he is a Finnish entrepreneur, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Heinilä. The name was almost correct. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of SMARP. At SMARP, we're redefining how companies communicate both internally and externally by making their own employees a core part of their communication strategy. We do this by providing an employee communications and advocacy app that, in effect, makes sure that employees are always well informed with the latest company news and content, as well as being able to share that content onwards to their own social networks, turning them into brand ambassadors for their employer. Instead of giving you a pitch today, I thought I would share a little bit about our story and how we got to where we are today. It all started in 2011, when me and my co-founder, while we're still studying in university, noticed that companies were not using social to its full potential. While most companies were investing heavily in creating a social media following, trying to get a high Twitter amount followers, trying to get LinkedIn followers, trying to get Facebook likes, they were missing the core element that social media has never been built with the relationship between companies and people at its core. It's been built around the relationship between people to each other. Realizing this, we were lucky enough to get to work with one of the largest listed companies in Finland, Metso, very early on. And we quickly found out that while they had 10,000 followers and 7,000 employees on LinkedIn, these 7,000 employees that they had actually had unique first degree connections to 260,000 people. Meaning that if only they were able to get their own employees involved in their communications efforts, instead of reaching 10,000 people, they would be able to reach 260,000. At this point, we realized that companies really needed to evolve the way that they communicate to adjust to the changing environment with social. And we set out to create a new market for employee advocacy. At the time, employee advocacy did not exist at all. Today, it has become a marketing megatrend. We wanted to create a platform and mobile apps that would make it extremely easy for employees to discover the latest company news, get it anywhere, anytime, wherever it fit them. We also wanted to make it easy for them to share that information to their network and actually visualize the impact that has. So when an employee shares some company news, open position, blog post, that they would actually be able to see, is this content interesting to my network or am I spamming them? If they're just sending out messages that are of no value to their networks, that's of no value to the brand either. So we wanted to help them turn themselves into thought leaders and experts in their own industry. Having uh, Having said that, it was not easy in the beginning. When we went to pitch our idea and tell companies that, hey, we would like to activate your employees on social, they said, employees and social, yes, how do we block that? Luckily, there were some forward-thinking companies, and very quickly, we were able to show over 450% return on investment to our early clients. And at that point, we realized we had pretty much stepped into a gold mine. We wanted to go international quickly. We know, knew that Finland is a small market, not very interesting to us. We need to go global. We started off by setting up a multinational sales force here in Finland, followed by setting up agency partnerships globally, where agencies would be able to sell our product in addition to their own added value services. Finally, we realized we need to be closer to our clients, and thereby we started out by opening a new office in London, followed by Stockholm and New York. Since then, our market has continued to evolve. It's been nice following a market that's changed completely from when we started and considering that we were there when the market got created. Today, employee advocacy is not that much about employees just sharing company content to their networks. More than that, it is about creating an engaged workforce that is always well informed and actually wants to be a brand ambassador for their employer because they enjoy working there and understand the mission and vision of the company. As our market has matured, we have grown as well. Today, we are a team. Today, we are the category leader in employee advocacy with 60 team members of 20 different nationalities on our team. We have four offices, as I mentioned earlier, and we're proud to have about 200 corporate clients, including some of the world's leading companies such as Unilever, Nissan, PwC, etc. We are truly aiming to revolutionize the way companies communicate by humanizing their brands and making knowledge sharing simple and rewarding for all employees. After all, today we live in a knowledge-based economy where real-time access to information can well be the defining factor between success and failure at a company. Thank you. Thank you. 
sorry, I, I think I almost pronounced your name right. Almost yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> I actually lived in Finland uh, before, but I, I, I forgot the language. I, I'll, I'll, come, <laughs> I'll come here more often. Yeah. I think I have about 20 different names by now. Okay. How do, you, how do they t uh, tell it Rope, in English? Rope, Rupert, Roper, Rope. Yeah. I'm getting used to yeah. all of them. Yeah. It's, it's, that's how it's been international. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for your pitch. Um, you mentioned that uh, like the thing that you are trying to, that you are creating, the, your startup, it's basically it's a totally new market. So you're basically creating your own market. How <laughs> how is it? I mean, isn't it like even twice as tough yeah. as a other kind of startup? So there is a big difference between evolving a market and creating a new market. When we that means that you actually have to, unfortunately, in the beginning, educate the market on what you're trying to get them to do. The upside is that it is a blue ocean market, meaning that every company out there is a potential client. Mm. That's where getting competitors in the market, today we have 50 plus competitors. When we launched, there was nobody. That is actually an upside in helping educate the market, but you just gotta make sure that you keep innovating. And while people keep telling you, no, employees don't mix with social, social is personal, Employee, employees don't wanna do that, you gotta keep believing in what you're doing and be able to prove them wrong, and be, you should be motivated by that. Hmm. And how is response from investors when you're presenting that you're going to do something totally new? Um, it's been, uh, it depends on the investor. Some people, they think of it from a personal level, that do they believe your story or not. That in mm -hmm. the end, it's all about creating a believable story that investors buy into and want to take that journey with you. Mm, cool, yeah. Um, so, um, how do you find clients? Like, if you don't have, if it's a new market. <laughs> in the beginning, it was tough. Them? Again, yeah. we were getting the reply that social media and employees don't mix. We want to block social at work. These two yeah. things will never, never be together. No. But luckily, today, that's changed quite a bit. I think there was an Altimeter study that showed 90% of companies are now looking into employee advocacy programs. So today, it's not about proving why they should do employee advocacy. It's about proving why they should do it today. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, how many employees are you now? 60. 60? Yeah, cool. based in uh, Helsinki, New York, Stockholm. Yeah. I was based in New York for the last year. I just moved back. My co-founder now runs our yeah. uh, New York office. Yeah. How do you, do you do Skype a lot? How do you organize your communication? We use and... Slack as yeah. well as our own tool, of yeah. course, that <laughs> when we have content, we use our own tool. When we just want to connect our employees to each other, we use Slack. Mm -hmm. But given it is every time you open up a new office, you are sacrificing internal communications to some extent. It will never be as effective over Slack as sitting next to somebody. Hmm. So you've got to make sure that the investment is worth it. Hmm. And um, I was wondering, um, when you open a new office, do you recruit people locally or how do you find people? We have noticed yeah. that it's good sending somebody over from one of our other offices so that we're able to take the company culture, hmm. that our key values, such as employees first, making sure that everybody's treated equally, making sure that we stand as a unified company. Mm. That means that we need to have somebody taking it there. It's not communicated over paper. Yeah, cool. Um, I have only one last question. And how, um, like, do you remember the time when you signed your first client? Yeah, we how signed the it? first client uh, back in 2012. How did it feel? Uh, it felt very good because yeah. everybody had been questioning. At the time, our business model was not great. Well, it was great for them. It was not too bad, good for us. Mm. So meaning that they uh, didn't pay us that much, but they got a lot of value. Yeah. But it still felt very good because that validated and kind of proved everybody wrong who had been saying that we can't do it. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck. in yeah. Slush. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks Thank you. for listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now the last startup on stage in the first session of uh, Nordic Showcase is Pleo, and uh, the entrepreneur's name is Jeppe Rindom. Thank you. So, Pleo is the first company card to come with an artificial assistant. Um, this is our team, a part of our team in Copenhagen. Uh, we built the company since early 2015. Um, my co-founder I know from, um, from a company called TradeShift, the Danish technology company, where I was the CFO. And as that company grew, I, um, I learned a, f a few things. I basically learned that to run a business today, um, you, can, you can pretty much access everything with just a few clicks. Think about it. You have 
travel, you have subscriptions, your software, um, your marketing. It's very, very available for business uh, today, and it all runs on cards. I also learned that these kind of purchases have become much more complex to handle. Now we're talking about a high proportion of subscriptions. We're talking about your card information being stored for repeat purchasing on Uber, on Amazon, and it's just hard for a business to manage. I learned that as employees, we walk into the organizations as consumers. We feel much more comfortable purchasing what we need for work ourselves because it's so available. Why would we ever want to instruct an assistant to book our travels? It's, it feels intimidating not to do that ourselves. But this kind of decentralized purchasing is also very, very hard for a company to manage. In our company, this whole concept created a lot of frustration. Employees, they didn't have their own cards. They were super frustrated about expense reports, finance. They spent way too much time on chasing receipts, understanding who has purchased what. Um, and even managers, they lacked insights of uh, their budgets. Um, we had to process everything and, and run reports after six weeks, and then the information was already uh, delayed. And we thought, you know, this in 2012 at that point, there's, there's got to be a solution that can solve this kind of uh, pain point. So we went to the bank and we realized a company card has not changed in 25 years. Yes, there's a chip, yes, there's contactless, but for me as a business person, I don't care. Uh, it was super cumbersome to get a card. It took six, eight weeks, envelopes back and forth, two signatures, uh, fixed rights, spending rights. It was a lot of trust to give a card to an employee. And because of that, um, we, we held them tight. Only a few people had a card, and, um, and, it, and we shared it. So we thought about it, and we sort of cleaned up the whiteboard, and then we created Playo. So Playo is basically a card to any of your employees in just a few seconds. You can assign a card, virtual or plastic. You can specify the limits as you're comfortable with, and it's right there available for them to use uh, in, in that moment. Once you use the card, you get a notification on your phone. You can, on the go, click on the notification, snap an image of the receipt, and then the system tries to organize the rest. It will categorize it for you. It would suggest a, pro a project number if you need that. And then the idea is that you're done. You just need to interact a few things, and then you're done. You don't have that pending expense report that we, that we all hate. Employees and managers can, of course, see all the spending as it happens, so you're, you're constantly on top of your company spending. And all the information, the transactions, the receipts are passed on to the accounting system to save a lot of time in the financing department. This was a taste about Playo. Um, we basically bring trust back to the employees. We allow them to focus on their expertise, and we take complexity out of finance. Thank you. I'm still jogging. <laughs> yeah. Good exercise. Thank you for your pitch. Um, so, uh, you worked before in a startup called uh, TradeShift, um, but you, you didn't found it, you, but you were in the beginning, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. So, what's, what, and you probably have a lot of wisdom from that mm -hmm. time that you implement in your new startup. Could you share maybe some sure. top three things? So, so, TradeShift is on a tremendous journey um, for 500 employees today. Uh, but I think one of the things that was a bit challenging in the beginning was to be a startup and sell into enterprises. No. Uh, being early, not so credible in the beginning, having a slim feature set. Um, and I think with Playo, we've sort of flipped it upside down and said, okay, we, we want to start to sell into the small businesses mm -hmm. that are a little bit more simple in their requirements. And um, I think it's proven that it's a bit easier for us to get going. Uh, but obviously, the, the, the size of the opportunities are also smaller. Mm. Uh, did you, like, how do you find your business model? Do you spend a lot of time to... Um, so to it's, it's a traditional uh, s subscription model um, yeah. per, per, per user per month, you could say. Mm. Um, and then we earn a little bit on the transactions as well. Mm. Um, you mentioned that you are the only Dane in the, in the company. Yeah. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, well, not anymore, but like right. until six weeks ago, I was the only Dane in the company, okay, uh, cool. which is a bit odd because we're based in Copenhagen. 
Um, but we're building an international business, and um, we're quite picky with the talent. So we, we search internationally, and if, if we find the right candidate, we, we bring them to Copenhagen. Huh. What, what kind of talent are you searching for? Uh, it's tech, it's uh, sales, oh. it's marketing, it's, it's huh. really uh, oh. customer success. It's, it's, it's quite broadly. Yeah. And yeah. How, are you also hiring many people now? We, we are hiring all the yeah. time, yeah. and I think we, the model of bringing people to Copenhagen from here and there is something we're really happy yeah, with. Yeah, that's like, why, why bring people to Denmark if it's yeah, a global it's, business? It's, Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it, it shows a lot of commitment that people are willing to travel to, yeah. to another city for, for this project. Hmm. And I think, you know, showing that you're willing to leave behind family and friends and, and join, you know, this company, it, it just, it, it builds a, a really, really strong culture and a sort of a family feeling that we are we're all there because of this purpose. Yeah. Uh, so we also have a lot of fun. Do you have to do, do, do some special stuff like uh, to build culture? Have um, any events? I or? mean, we, we obviously spend a lot of time together. We, um, next week we go to Sweden for three days for a, for a hackathon and stuff like that. Um, we have events at night, but you know, I think just, just the fact that everyone invests into to being with each other builds, builds a good culture. Hmm. Um, are you thinking, Sometimes when I talk to entrepreneurs, they uh, some of them say like, "We are never going to sell. We're going to build the company for 20 years and, and further." Do you have any thoughts on that? On this? Like, do, um, do you think like we're going to sell from when you start the company, or is it something that will come? I, I think you know when we started the company, we, we wanted to build something that had a vision big enough to scale it. Yeah. And I think with this, we can take it across borders. We can go up the market for larger enterprises. We can go in the direction of being more an alternative to a bank. There's so many paths we can go. Yeah. So I think you know. The opportunities are there, and as long as it's fun, you know, we'll we'll keep on pursuing them. Yeah, yeah. That's a great ending. Cool. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was the last startup in the first session of Nordic Showcase. So uh, thank you so much for your time and thanking for thank you for uh, letting me be host. Enjoy. <laughs>